Hi, everyone. Morning, Rabbi. Needless to say, the plumber didn't come. So, anyway. Sorry? The plumber no, didn't was, come? Was, the plumber was supposed to come. He's not here yet. So, uh, oh. we'll start in the meantime. Okay. Let me just get my hi, Mark. They're always late, aren't they? Plumbers. Yeah. People like that. Morning. Okay. Morning. Morning, Mark. Morning. Just a reminder, we're hopefully back. Are you all right? Mark, we're hopefully back in Shaw this Shabbos, as you may be aware. Oh, oh, be oh very good. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great. My youngest girl is okay. quarantined at the moment. Oh dear. Somebody in her year group at school has, has actually got COVID. So they're all oh, quarantined. And, oh, gosh. She, she says that the only class, she, she it's not in her actual class, only in her year group, but um, she does have Spanish with that girl. Gosh. Gosh. Okay, I'll be back in a moment. Yeah. <sighs> uh, morning, Pam. Morning. Pam. Morning. Morning. How are you? All right? Yes, fine. Thank you. Oh, yeah, no. oh good. Right. Okay, so, <clears throat> so um, the original aim was to go through the 39 malachas, the labors, um, relatively quickly. Um, in the event, it does take time. One second, let me get my book. But um, although we've discussed examples, the aim is. To get through all 39, even if you do one a week, it's going to take another few months. But to get through all 39 and come back and do the halachas in more detail, um, which may, I know we're cooking, we discussed in a bit more detail, but I'm, I don't claim to have covered it. It's more to just get the general idea. So just to summarize, the ones we did so far um, was what we call sidura de pas. That means the order of baking of bread. It's the malachas needed to break the various sorry break bake the various breads the show breads so we had choresh plowing zorea sowing coats reaping once you've sown and grown then gathering ma'ameh threshing which is dosh in hebrew winnowing zora sorting bora grinding tochen marakid which was sifting losh which was kneading and finally bishel which is cooking or baking so that's 11 malachas so far um, that we've covered in generalities. I'm not claiming to cover them in complete detail. Oops. Right, now, the next group, <clears throat> if you think back to your tabernacle, your mishkan, in addition to having various uh, um, <clears throat> various uh, breads, the other thing which is quite major is um, basically what we call the order of garments. It's not really garments, but it's it's textiles and fabrics. There were elaborate hangings that hung in the Mishkan. There were a number of malachas which were necessary in order to, um, in order to, to construct them. I'm just going to see if I can post a picture if it works. Just one sec, it may not work. Okay. It's kind of weird. Um, yeah. Sorry? No, it's all right, it was just queried the English. Okay. My English. No, Pam's English, not yours. <laughs> So I'm just going to see if I can get this to publish picture. Your volume is much better today, Rabbi. Good. Oh, yeah, it is. Okay, I'm just going to share a picture, hopefully, assuming this works. What, right. Can everyone see that? She was there. Yeah. Yeah. 
So these are the, uh, let's zoom in a little bit. Oops. So, oops, too much. These are the malachas involved in the making of the, uh, the hangings. So you've got, mm -hmm. first thing you need to do is you need to get your wool. So you shear your sheep. That's gozes is to shear. Then you have malabin, which is scouring to clean the wool. And then manafets, you comb it. And after you've done that, you dye it, coloring. And after you've done that, you spin it into a thread. And then you basically weave it. There are various malachas in weaving, warping, um, constructing the actual loom and the actual weaving in and out. And then you have pote, which is unraveling threads right at the end when you tie it all together. Anyone here ever done crocheting, made a kippah? Well, I haven't made a kippah, <laughs> but I've certainly crocheted. Right, so at the end you have to tie everything off, don't you? Um, well, sew it in. And what happens if something breaks? You have to tie it or untie it. And they've got sewing and we've got career tearing. So these are all basically sewing related malochas. So in the same way that we had a bunch of malochas that are to do with agriculture, and you might say, well, who knows about these things? I suppose if you're not a, um, a seamstress or seamster, whatever, is a seamster, male seamstress? I suppose so. I know, never heard it. I've never heard it used before. It's shocking, isn't it? There's no word for male seamstress, disgraceful. Taylor, Taylor. Huh? Taylor, yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah, I guess actually, yeah. Um, so those are the malachas. So we're going to we're going to go through those. Um, but you don't have a tailoress, do you? You do. Yeah. You do. do you? Yeah. Have you heard the word tailoress? Yeah. 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 Um, I think my grandma was one. Yeah. Yeah. My All grandma right. was one. Oh, I, I thought I thought that that was one of those words that didn't have a female. Uh, it's a word I I remember actually. Yeah. Right. Oh, well, you learn something new every day. <laughs> We're going over to see if you're at the other window. And there's a baby sleeping. Okay. Right, the plumber is here, but yeah. Nima's speaking to them. Window, so the kitchen window. Okay. Hopefully I won't get disturbed. Okay, right, so... <clears throat> um, there are 13 of these all together. I think there were 11 of the previous ones. And there's 13 of these to do with textiles. <clears throat> so the first one is gozes, which is shearing of sheep. Um, How would you say that? Go gozes. Um, there's a passage in the Chumash. I'm trying to think who it was. Someone that was going out to shear his sheep. Ligzos Sonov. He was loving. Um, shearing, gozes, gimel, zion, zion is the root. So you need wool for your hangings. To get wool, you obviously need to shear a sheep. So what is shearing? Shearing is severing or uprooting a growing part of the body of a creature, even if the creature is no longer alive. So this would include plucking hairs from your head or body, like plucking your eyelashes or something like that, um, cutting nails. Removing hair, cutting hair, even just a single hair from a human or animal with a scissors or a clipper is gozes. Pulling out a hair, by the way, is not gozes. Midorisa. <clears throat> First of all, it's painful. It's not normal. Um, but interesting, if it was the way you'd normally do it, so I don't know, pull eyebrows with tweezers, that might be midorisa. So in other words, what is the biblical prohibition? The biblical prohibition is cutting or clipping or shearing of hair or some other body part that's attached. Um, why would pulling out hair from your hair or your beard or whatever, or I don't know, waxing or whatever, not necessarily be, because that's not the normal method of shearing. It would still be probably rabbinically prohibited. Biting off hair is not derisa, again, it's not the normal way, but you still shouldn't do it. It's a rabbinic prohibition. Um, so... <clears throat> Thank you. Are they here? Oh, we haven't come yet. Okay. So the example it gives here is if a woman pulls out a single gray hair, then that's goes there because that's how you normally do it. Oh man. They're supposed to come here, I think. Yes. Sorry, one sec, just trying to sort out the plumber. Um Okay, 
they've gone to short instead of here. Never mind. Okay. <clears throat> um, so hair removing, whether it's a liquid, an ointment, a wax, a salve, a soap, anything that removes hair would come under the malach of gozes. Yeah, I don't know if hair removal is so crucial that people feel they have to do it every single day. Yeah. Okay. Um. I'd have a beard like yours if I didn't, Rabbi. <laughs> too much information, I think. Okay. <clears throat> Did you know that in the times of the Talmud, mirrors used to have sharp edges? So that you didn't just look in the mirror, but you could actually kind of like use the edge to trim your hair. Hmm. Yeah. Dual purpose. I don't know exactly how that worked. I'm imagining it was kind of handheld mirror and you would sort of like do something like that with it. Kind of. Anyway, <clears throat> so we find that there were prohibitions against even looking in the mirror on Shabbos. Nowadays, that's not the case. So you're allowed to look in the mirror on Shabbos. <clears throat> Interestingly and very controversially, we just mentioned pulling out a gray hair as an example of, of shearing. So <coughs> the Torah says that a man shouldn't dress in women's clothing. This is obviously a very contemporary issue of gender fluidity and stuff. Um, but the classic example that the, the halakhic authorities give, because I, I apologize to all the ladies here if you find this uh, stereotypical, but apparently pulling out individual gray hairs is a very feminine thing to do. Um, so if men do it, you see, oh, I've got a gray hair in here, I'll just pull it out. Apparently that's considered emulating the fairer sex. Um, okay, I guess just send them here, I'll send in the doorbell. And the other example is, um, interestingly, it says, look in the mirror. It says, men shouldn't look in mirrors here. <laughs> it's a very feminine thing to do. Anyway, because um, you need to prepare for your makeup and things like that. Anyway. Okay. So removal of hair is gozes. That would include from animal skin, even a dead animal. So maybe possibly a problem of pulling out feathers from chickens. Let's see. Um, yes. After it's cooked is permitted because the cooking loosens them anyway. You don't have this problem nowadays. And I remember the old days when chickens came with lots of feathers and things. A good kosher chicken had lots, always had feathers, I think. No? Um, no coating or brushing hair? Problematic. Sorry? I think the butcher used to burn them off before you uh, before you got it. Oh, okay. It was this horrible, horrible smell of uh, gas, which was always <laughs> a light in the in the butcher shop, um, because he'd been searing off the um, feathers. It was horrible. Oh, right. I never liked the smell of butcher shops anyway. Still yeah. don't actually. Um, combing or brushing hair could be a problem because you pull out hair. Right? You know, if you comb your hair, you often get bits of hair caught in the comb or the brush. <clears throat> um, the solution to that, by the way, would be to brush your hair with a soft brush that doesn't pull out hairs. <laughs> um, or gently. Uh, I've only got to run my hand over my hair and the and hair falls out. So you probably shouldn't do that on Shabbos then. <laughs> When I was in yeshiva, it's quite a bad habit. It's actually a bit disgusting. I, you don't really think about it, I guess. It's something that guys do in yeshiva. But I remember once we were at a Shabbaton, somebody said, like, made a comment about people's personal grooming. But I, I don't know if I'd probably do it as well. But if people probably do it long hair, but if you have a beard, people often kind of like twirl, twirl the beard hairs and kind of play with them with their fingers and so on and do that. Um, it's quite easy to pull hairs out. So this is a problem. So I had a friend who said that he used to always like twirl and twist and whatever his beard and he stopped doing it because on Shabbos he couldn't help himself and he was pulling hairs out basically. Rabbi, um, does it matter if you're, you're not meaning to do that? Though, ah, so, yeah. Right, so it doesn't matter if you're not meaning to do it. So the answer to that would be, um, let me just get the phone because it's Beverly, it's probably about the plumber. Sorry, one second. Hello? Right. He hasn't rung the bell. I'll go let him in. One sec. Okay. Sorry, just going to let the plumber in. Back in a sec. <laughs> okay. I can see.
I've always thought it was very unfair. My girl's father only has to shave once a week. My father oh. shaved two or three times a day. He shaved in really? the morning wow. before he went to work. And he shaved, he had, um, my mother wouldn't let him go uh, in bed unless he'd shaved. And if we were going out anywhere, oh. he would shave before we went out and then shave again before he went to bed. Gosh. Oh. Because that's, his hair grew so quick, his beard grew so quickly. And I'm afraid I've taken after my father. But my, my girl's father only has to shave once a week. I don't think he could grow a beard if he tried. It, my, my friend's father, it's only got oh. a little bit on the very tip of his chin. Mm. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Not fair. Charity, this is you do. I'll say on that back one. It's very small if it does. Oh, oh there she is. Let me just put that did, in. Did she die? She was the one that choked. Oh, no. oh sausage. Yeah. Oh. That's, what, that's how it all started. Info at something dot org. Oh, okay. It's very small, isn't it? Compared Terrible. To... Can't read it. Right, these next week, can't I? Mm -hmm. yeah, can you see what it says? But any details? Didn't we give anything before? No. Uh, we had the um, talk. What talk? In the back of the weeks ago. You know that talk on choking? Mm. Wasn't it's there any, yeah, wasn't there any details with it? No, I think the charity. He, did, he did it as a result of oh, okay. maybe he knew the family or okay. just knew of the case, but maybe the rabbi knows. But if you just put um like candles for Sadie, it'll come up. Yeah. I could have a look on it. It's her birthday the other day. It's tra tragic, isn't it? Mm. It's like tragic. What's tragic? A little girl, it, it, a, a little died. girl that died from eating um, sausage in a nursery. She Choke, was Jewish. Choked. 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 Yes, yes, I know. Yeah. Anyway, we, we were um, in North West London briefly yesterday visiting Rachel and Stu. Yeah. And we went into a deli. And they, they had this thing about lighting pink candles. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Last, oh, last Shabbat, but we didn't have any then. And the, you could oh. still get them. Oh. So we picked them up. And then the idea is you donate to a, the charity. We were just looking it up, that's all. I see. It'll be on there somewhere. Yeah. That's it. OK. Um, give me two seconds. Nick? Yes, fundraising page. Okay. We'll do that later. All right. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so um, Pam just asked a very good question. So, like, what if you don't intend it? So, in Iris's case, you just touch your hair, it falls out. Um, I suppose if you know it's going to fall out, you should try to avoid touching it. Um, the general rule, the reason you're allowed to brush your hair with a soft brush, for example, is I'm not guaranteeing to you a soft brush won't pull out hair, but you very much reduce the possibility. So we've seen before, we spoke about the, if you recall, what we call the PSIG ratio, which is the absurd example the Talmud gives of somebody who says, I want to play football, but I don't have a football. I'll just shack this chicken and use its head as a football. Oh, whoops, it died, right? doesn't work. You can't do that. You can't pretend that you don't know the outcome of something that's guaranteed. So I know that if I um, comb my hair or my beard, that hairs are going to come out. So I shouldn't do it. Um, what's far less problematic is if I do it in such a way that's not reasonably likely to cause a problem. So I'll give you an example, classic problem. 
Um, most of us don't, well, you don't take a bath on Shabbos unless you have to go to the mikveh, say, for um, if, if, you're, if you're a lady or, or men that go sometimes Shabbos morning. Um, but, you know, you're drying your face. Let's say you washed your face and you're drying it, right? You're drying it with a towel. Um, if you, if you, you know, let's say you just, I don't know, dabbed your face with water and you dry your hair with a rough towel. If you rub it vigorously, you'll probably get hairs coming out, right? Same can happen with body hair as well if you use a towel, right? If you're vigorous enough. So um, you shouldn't do it in such a way that you probably pull out hairs. Now, if you take a soft towel and you rub yourself dry slightly and a hair happens to come out, which is extremely unlikely, then it's far less problematic. When we talk about cleaning your teeth, it's going to be the same issue with gums bleeding as well. So if you're taking reasonable precautions to avoid it and it still happens, but you didn't, the outcome was far less predictable, then it's far less problematic. The problem with a hard brush or comb is you pretty much know that it's... Um, that it's going to pull out hairs, basically. Pulling out hairs on Shabbos is a problem. Now, if you wear a shaitol, even if it's human hair, then you can brush it to your heart's content because it's dead hair. You're not pulling it out of anything that's growing. There you go. If, um, <laughs> if the hair has already fallen out at the roots, but it's still clinging to its little friends, right. and... And it's not actually being pulled out of your hair when you brush it. Right. Is that okay? So if you have alopecia or you, I don't know, it's age related, or let's say you have a dog and the dog is molting, right? And when dogs molt, the hair just kind of falls off. It doesn't pull out. So I don't I think, think we I'm would molting. Say, sorry? I'm molting. Okay. I don't <laughs> think we're going to say you can't pat your dog or stroke your dog because the hair's going to fall off. But we would say you can't. Let's say you have, I don't know, uh, poodle or something with very tight no not a poodle they have no hair at all do they like it's all very tight um but you know you wouldn't run your fingers through your dog's hair and pull it out but if the dog's molting or something right oh yeah people molt i guess so yes in that scenario if you know you've got or let's say i don't know you just had a haircut right and you didn't get cleaned properly and you've got loads of hairs stuck to you and you didn't have a chance to shower which is a bit disgusting but anyway you know to sort of rub your hair like that i don't think there's a problem because as you said, the hairs are already detached. That's a different story. Sorry, one sec. So, are you okay there? Sorry about all the stuff. Yeah, yeah, I should have, should have warned you. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Um, right, uh, we're nearly going to take a break in a minute. Um, if you have to remove nits from a child's hair, particularly a three-day yomtev, we will come to what to do about that. Um, if you have to remove chewing gum from your hair, we'll look at that. What about, right, here's one. How do you remove a plaster? Pulls off hairs, doesn't it? Hmm, good point. Something to think about. Scabs. Okay. People shouldn't do it, but if it falls off or something like that. Definitely can't cut your nails, which would then include biting your nails. Um, ingrowing toenails, cutting nails for mikvah. We'll talk about all these things. But bottom line, that's basically what... Gozes is so gozes is shearing, so it's cutting hair or nails or bodily. I suppose the same would apply to dry skin. Actually, you know, if you've got dry skin, you rub your skin, or you've got dandruff and you rub your hair, or whatever. Same principle might apply because it's something that grows, that's joined somewhat. Um, we shall see. Okay, so that's the first for those who are just joining us. The first eleven malachas were to do with baking bread. The next. 13 are to do with um, the preparation of the wall hangings, the tapestries in the Mishkan. And from there, we derive a number of prohibitions of Shabbos. Um, I think we'll pause there for five minutes. Sorry, it's been a bit uh, interrupted. And we'll just go and get a cup of coffee or something. And we'll carry on with Pasha oh, right. in five minutes. Yeah, so uh, First you help yourselves bacon bread. to a cup of coffee or something. I will see you in a few minutes. Morning, Brenda. Okay. Morning, morning, Jeff. Morning. Morning. Morning, Brenda. Morning, morning whoever. Jeff. Morning. Hello. Morning, morning Beryl Walmer. Morning. Well, it's not David, but some David's. I don't know what your name is. Deborah. Deborah. Morning, Deborah. Deborah. Good morning, Deborah. Yeah. I've got to get home. Morning, Deborah. Morning. I've just got to make a phone call. I've got to get hold of someone. <laughs> it was very nice, John Altman, last night, wasn't it? 
Really good. Really yeah. good. Yeah. He's got he's got so so many so stories many to tell. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I thought it was a jazz concert. No. Oh. He did, oh. he did, no, he did play some um film clips and all sorts of things, but he basically he he was to, to, telling a lot of stories okay. about things that have happened in his life with and uh, and famous people but he's not like big headed about it is no, he he just no. he's just sort of he was oh i misunderstood i thought it was yeah. going to be um a jazz concert with him playing no. so i didn't bother no. to go because it didn't interest me yeah. Yeah. He, did. He, he just played a little bit at the end yes yeah. it was really good I wish I'd gone to it then. I think it's you been always, recorded. Paris, you always give it a try. And if you don't like it, you leave, you know. No, that's it. That's yeah. bad manners. No, I, I would feel very right. rude if I, I, if people saw me on the on the screen and well, and then I suddenly disappeared. Yeah, but you could I, I would feel bad mannered. Yeah, but you could always say you had to go for yes, something. Exactly. Like that's telling lies. Yes, the the concert in the afternoon was a. Well, I, I agree. I don't like to, I don't like telling lies, Iris. I yeah. agree there. I mean, I don't mind telling a lie for a good purpose to avoid upsetting somebody, but yeah. I mean, that would feel, it would just feel wrong. Yeah. Mm. You but could there's always. There's uh, lots of reasons me. why you leave. The phone rings or, you yeah. know, lots of reasons. Mm. My phone hardly ever rings, <laughs> in the, except it's junk mail, junk calls. <laughs> I've had three of those this morning already. Really? Really? Well, no, I mean, uh, there were two, two, mess, uh, two messages and a junk mail uh, and, a, and a junk call. The messages were not, not junk, but they weren't ones that I, want, uh, I had to answer. Yes, but I was, you, could, you, yeah. you could have joined it without the video, so they wouldn't really know who you were. You, yeah. You could have done it that yeah. way. No, but then you get you your name comes up with a um, a black screen with these white shapes on it, like Beryl's got up on hers. If you come up without video, that's what you get. What Beryl's um, screen looks like. You can you can put a photograph there. Look, this is my photograph, and it's still got the name on it. Yeah, but yeah, it's still no. got the name. And then if you go if you go away, it it um it um. It go it goes off. Yes, but I don't I don't I don't think my name's on the on there, is it? Is it no, there, Iris? No, it just says iPad. Yeah, so yes, but I do you yeah. know, I don't know how to alter mine to do that, so I don't no um um I don't know why my name doesn't come up, so <laughs> it's, it's always you, been there nice. you are, I, I don't know nice. what I did to make mine come up. Yeah, you, you might you might have to print it <laughs> in somewhere. Don't think so. Don't, oh, well, well, I don't you, have to go, so. you have to go to settings. Oh right. You have to go oh. on to settings. Oh settings. Say, yeah, settings, and then it will say um your iPad, like it will say iPad, whatever your number is, and then you change it to your name. Because that's what I did. Oh. oh. I, I mine was coming oh, up right. without my name. So I put my got my name on it. I don't know how I uh, 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 um I can't recall having done anything in settings to do that, but must have done. I suppose so maybe I must have done. Or maybe it's automatic, I don't know. No, I don't think so. Because we've just got men. Oh, right. Well, maybe maybe my Danielle did it. Yes, they probably did, when perhaps whoever set you up, because yeah. whoever set me up didn't put my name on it. Uh-huh. I set it up myself, but I didn't do it. Completely right. You're clever if you can set it up yourself. Well, it just says ending, <laughs> but um, I think that's good enough. So it doesn't matter who comes on, if it's Jeff or me, you know. Yeah. Yours just says bending. <sighs> no, I, I rely on my Danielle for that's anything okay, to do with computers. Sorry? I say that's okay, as long as you've got somebody to do it. 
That's it. I rely yeah. on her. I, I, I phone her whenever anything goes wrong with it and she talks me through yeah. whatever else has gone wrong. That's good. I don't know whether you, you probably won't remember because it's not, it, it's not, it doesn't concern you, but I had a point where my, my computer, it decided that although it would give me perfectly good vision, it wouldn't give me any volume, no sound at all. And I took it into a guy who used to have a um, computer repair shop up in up at the castle, hmm. and he gave that up. But it, he he used to do part of the computer repairs. Hmm. But now he he helps his wife in a, a gift shop, and I took it into him and asked him if he could tell me or show me what to do or, or do it for me. And he couldn't work out what was wrong with it. So I phoned up Danielle in, at uni and she talked me through it and got it back working. So she's better than a computer repair man. <laughs> Very good. I don't know what I'd do good. without her. Wow. The longer... Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, yeah. Rabbi. Is it loud and clear? Yes. Loud and clear. Great, uh, fantastic. Right, just yes. in the Facebook link and then we'll start, hopefully. Okay. Okay, here we go. Oops. Okay, nearly there. <clears throat> I was just saying, Iris, but I was on mute. It's probably not repair man anymore. It's repair person. Yeah. I don't care. <laughs> repair man or repair woman? Chair man, chair woman. Well, no, chairman is chairman is not a man. Chairman is not a man, is it? It's just it's the name of the person who's the chair. But it's now it's chair person. Yeah, apparently, much, much longer to say. Okay, yeah. can everyone see that? Yeah, mm -hmm. right. So, we right. are still doing this in memory of Lord Tax, who's by the way, the Shloshim is next Sunday, and there is a gathering that's taking place online. I think his office is organizing. I will share the details of that when I remember to do that. Okay, so Iris, over to you. Vaishlach. Is that too small, or can you see it? Okay, uh, well, I'll have to. Um... Grow you know you can it. yeah you can zoom yeah sorry i normally do it in two pages i do you want me to just quickly just split a, i think it's just about right yeah okay otherwise i can okay. okay right off we go jacob returns to the holy land after a 20 year stay in haran and sends angel emissaries to esau in hope of a reconciliation but his messengers report that his brother is on the warpath, 400 armed men. Jacob prepares for war, prays, and sends Esau a large gift, consisting of hundreds of heads of livestock to appease him. That night, Jacob ferries his family and possessions across the Jabbok River. He, however, remains behind and encounters the angel that embodies the spirit of Esau, with whom he wrestles until daybreak. Jacob suffers a dislocated hip, but vanquishes the supernal creature who bestows on him the name Israel, which means he who prevails over the divine. Jacob and Esau meet, embrace and kiss, but part ways. Jacob purchases a plot of land near Shechem, whose crown prince, also called Shechem, abducts and rapes Jacob's daughter Dinah. Dinah's brothers, Simeon and Levi, avenge the deed by killing all male inhabitants of the city after rendering them vulnerable by convincing them to circumcise themselves. Jacob journeys on. Rachel dies while giving birth to her second son, Benjamin, and is buried in a roadside grave near Bethlehem. Reuben loses the birthright because he interferes with his father's mar marital life. Jacob arrives in Hebron to his father Isaac, who later dies at age 180. Rebecca has passed away before Jacob's arrival. 
Our Parsha concludes with a detailed account of Esau's wives, children and grandchildren. The family histories of the people of Seir, among whom Esau settled, and a list of the eight kings who ruled Edom, the land of Esau and Seir's descendants. Right, thank you very much. So a lot's happening this week. Okay, um, so we're actually going to look at the issue of Rochel's burial. Right? Could, could, we, could we just I'll stop for, just for a moment there? Yeah. Um, it said that um, Jacob sent angel emissaries yes i thought he sent servants so i think the the mafarshim the commentaries say that uh, he was able to tap into okay. uh, to send angelic uh, uh, messengers he okay had, uh, and it also the, says he was well connected <laughs> <laughs> and yes. it also says that um the angel that jacob wrestled with embodied the spirit of Esau. As first I've yeah, heard that the commentaries story. say that it was the, his guardian angel. Everyone has their guardian, guardian angel. angel. Yeah, that came to make trouble. Oh. So it's all very symbolic. I see. Lots of angels and demons. Well, angels anyway, this week. Um, we're going to talk about something much more simple, which is the small matter of, um, who knows who's buried in the cave of the, Mach, uh, ma uh, the patriarchs? Abraham. Oh, Abraham. Abraham. Abraham and Sarah. Yeah. Jacob and uh, um, Isaac and Rebecca. Yeah. Jacob and Leah. And Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve, yes. And um, so, who's conspicuously absent from that? Rebecca, is Rachel, Bill, Rachel. Bill, and Zilpa. Well, them as well, but no, Rachel, right? Rachel. Then Bill and Zilpa, yeah, I guess that. I guess Bill and Zilpa fulfilled their purpose of being basically concubines for the production of children. Um, I don't. It does say he married them. Actually, it's a good question how that all worked. But anyway, Rachel certainly Maybe. is notably missing. Um, Kevin Rachel. Her grave is on the way to Bethlehem, Shechem, which is Nablus and Bethlehem. Sorry, it's in Shechem, which is now known as Nablus, but of course, biblically was known as Shechem. Um, and yes, it's on the way to Bethlehem. And you may want to know the famous story that on their way to on their way into exile, they stopped to pray by our, our matriarch Rachel's grave and it gave them great comfort. Uh, excuse me, Rabbi, pilgrimage. can I clarify something there? You just said that Rachel was uh, buried near Shechem. Sorry, no, sorry, no, I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Sorry, Joseph's grave is in Shechem. Sorry, what am I talking right, about? No, right. yes, sorry, it's on well, the way to Bethlehem. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't make sense. Sorry, yes. No, 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 sorry, sorry, completely wrong. Joseph, Keva Yosef is in Shechem, I believe, yeah, because it was unfortunately just destroyed at one point. Okay, so let's have a look at this whole business. Uh, who would like to read source number one? Oh, sorry. Let me just get my charge on my laptop's about to die. Just bear with me a sec. Just plugging in. Got that. Right. Okay. Who would like to read source number one? This is from this week's Sedra. Um, basically about what happened with Rachel's death. By the way, anyone remember why she died? Because of the idol. She took her father's idol. Well, it wasn't that. And died who, about it. Who got her well, who got her into hot water? Huh? It, it was, if you recall, her you. significant other who declared whoever stole the idols deserves to die yes. because he thought it was one of the servants serving idolatry he didn't know it was his wife Rachel because he's a righteous man God listens to his words so careful what you wish for as they say so all rather unfortunate so of course she dies in childbirth famously so yes let's uh let's see what happened who'd like to read source number one do you want me to Rabbi? please off you go Pam, yes <laughs> Uh, and they journeyed from Bet El, and they, and there was still some distance to come to Ephrat. And Rachel gave birth, and her labour was difficult. It came to pass when she had such difficulty giving birth that the midwife said to her, "Do not be afraid, for this one too is a son for you." And it came to pass when her soul departed, for she died that 
she died, that she named him Ben-Oni, but his father called him Benjamin. So Rachel died, and she was buried on the road to Ephrat, which is Bethlehem. And Jacob erected a monument on her grave. That is the tombstone of Rachel until this day. Okay. Um, okay. So Rachel gets buried on the way to Bethlehem. All right. And it says, it sounds like, um, yes. And Yaakov put up a monument to her. Um, rather interestingly, of course, what were his instructions around his own death? That he wanted to be in, buried in, in Machpela. Right. So he had two wives. I don't know how he decided which one, but uh, so we see. Uh, okay, she died young. Look, sometimes when people die unexpectedly, we had a very close friend who was a very, very big Zionist who died quite young, and it was all a bit too much for the family, and he probably would have wanted to be buried in Israel, but he was buried locally to where he was because uh, it was very difficult for them. Um, it could be they'll move his remains one day, but at the moment he's he's in Cardiff, and that's you know that you, you don't always plan for these things, you know. So um, okay, so let's see the contrast. Let's see Jacob at the time of his death and what he says to Joseph, uh, who would like to read. Any volunteers? Please, please. It's but um, it's, but I'm sure um, this is a very simple question. It's but. Why wasn't she buried in the cave of Machpelah? That's what we're going to see. That's a very good question. It wasn't an oversight. It was very yeah, deliberate. Yeah, was, and it centers on yeah. her it centers on her role as the archetypal Jewish mother who cries for her children, which she can do from a place of exile. So let's see. Um off you go. Who Deborah, was that you? Beryl? Who was volunteering? I didn't Deborah. Deborah, yes. please. Uh, yeah. And when the time approached for Israel to die. He summoned his son Yosef and said to him, do me this favor, place your hand under my thigh as a pledge of your steadfast loyalty. Please do not bury me in Egypt. When I lie down with my fathers, take me up from Egypt and bury me in their burial place. He replied, I will do as you have spoken. And he said, swear to me, and he swore to him. Then Israel bowed at the head of the bed. Okay, so to be fair, Rachel was buried in the in the Holy Land, but not in the cave of the patriarchs. Jacob says, I don't want to be buried in Egypt, please take me to be buried with my forefathers. So there's a it seems to be a different set of instructions, one rule for one, one rule for another. Now let's see because sorry? he's he's not called Jacob in this, he's called Israel. Yeah, um, there is a rule which I can't remember the basis of as to, we have an interesting situation. Ordinarily, when someone's name is changed, they're not referred to by the previous name again. So you have Avram becomes Avraham, Sarai becomes Sarah, um, Hoshea becomes Yehoshua, Joshua, and they're never referred to by the previous name again. The exception to that is Yaakov and Yisrael. They're interchangeable. And there is a rule of thumb, and I can't remember. If anyone remembers, please help me out as to when it's Yaakov, when it's Yisrael. And I can't remember what the answer is, unfortunately. I believe it's when Israel's more more spiritual. I think that's could be makes sense. So they are used interchangeably. Obviously, Israel's particularly the father of the nation and so on um but there is a rule and i can't remember what it is so so far we've got let's just go back a second we've got this week's edra where they're journeying from betel and mm. the Ra rachel dies and she gets buried along the way the next source i showed you is looking back this is from vayachi at the end of Bereshis, when yaakov is coming close to his time mm. to die or yisrael even just by the way on a side note here um we obviously don't know exactly when we're going to die unless you get to 120 and it's your i think i told the story of rabbi mallets in liverpool who lived till his i think his 90s they said he had great honor for his parents interestingly and we know that's one of the things that caused long life um not causes i mean there's a you know a segula 
a good omen for long life. Um, Rabbi Malitz used to say, bis 120 on ein tag, which means till 120 in one day, because he said, who wants to die, die on their birthday? Though Moshe, of course, died My on My mother birthday. did. <laughs> died on her birthday? Yes. Quite a lot of people do, actually. It's a sign of righteousness. You complete your years. That's what we learned from Moshe. His Yotzeit was his birthday. That, if you recall, was uh, was Haman's mistake, right? That Haman thought that Ada was a bad month for the Jews because it's the month in which Moshe died. Yeah, the two mistakes he made. Number one, Moshe was also born in that month. Number two, a, a, a Yotzeit is not is not necessarily a sad day. It's a sad day for the family left behind, but it's a day of elevation. Um, anyway. We don't know exactly when we're going to die um, spiritually. <coughs> um, we often find in the Torah it says someone was coming close to death. Now, whether that means they're approaching age 120 or they were getting naturally older, we quite often find people putting their affairs in order, interestingly. Um, a comment I would make from too many visits to end of life patients is that as much as people don't have control, obviously you don't have control. If you had control, we'd all live till 120. As much as we don't have control over when we leave this world, there is clearly some um, force at play that we don't understand. Um, and the, yeah. the, the example I will give you is that many, many times you have someone who's given 24 hours to live and their grandson's coming from Australia to visit. Yeah. And they hold, they hold out for an extra week against yeah. all the odds. Or uh, you have situations where the family have been by someone's bedside for 36 hours and they go to get a cup of coffee and the person slips away. <laughs> and I always say to families in that situation, and they say, oh, you know, if only we'd been there, we feel terrible. I say, please don't feel terrible. Mm -hmm. As much as they had no control, they clearly knew what they were doing. I don't know. I can't explain to you how a person chooses when to go out of this world. But if you were there for 36 hours and you left for 10 minutes and that's when they left this world, then clearly they, they didn't want you to be there. There are many, many things like that. Stories when, my, like that and... when my friend in Israel, um, her mother was in hospital dying. I, I sort of used to look after her and I went to the hospital and the, uh, um, the, the doctor said that she hadn't got long to live, just a few days maybe. Yeah. And so I would phoned the, my friend and they got um, tickets immediately and mm -hmm. were coming straight over. And I sat there all that night holding her hand and saying to her, hold on, Jeanette's coming. Jeanette will be here soon. And she did. She w She w didn't seem to be conscious at all, but her daughter had only been there for about half an hour yeah. when she died. Believe, but she yeah. managed, she made it through that last 24 yeah. hours. Yeah. yeah. And you have it from the other side as well. Many times a family, somebody is in great pain and they seem to be holding on and holding on and Sometimes if the family say to them, we, we don't want to lose you and we'll miss you and, you know, it, but we don't want to see you suffering. The person is then able to slip away. So I, I'm, obviously we can't control when we go. If we could, we'd all live to 120, presumably. But there's clearly some something at play there, which is bigger than certainly all of us. Um, so it's interesting when it talks about he approached the time to die. I don't know if he was, he wasn't 120 at the time, but I suppose a person knows, start to get things in order. Rabbi, an angel comes and accompanies you. Yeah, but I don't know if you, I don't know what stage you, we do have stories of people who had near-death experiences um, of various varieties. And there are stories, but we don't really know. So, um, but yes, clearly, I mean, the other thing is you have many, many stories of people who uh, have said something or done something which with hindsight has... Uh, has made more sense. The person I mentioned to you that was buried not in Israel in the end, um, died in his 50s quite suddenly. Um, he was a computer buff and normally his wife didn't know his passwords and things. And I think that day he'd said to her, you know what, I should probably write down all the passwords for you just in case you ever need them, you know? So he clearly knew. Um, Rabbi Sachs evidently had prepared a lot more work than usual. Now he knew he was ill. I mean, he may have well known, I think more than we knew, um, but he'd prepared a lot of material ahead of time. Um, there's all kinds of things like that. So mm -hmm. I can't explain it to you, but there's there's definitely bigger forces at play. So anyway, the time is approaching for him to die, whatever that means. So we've got this contrast. Rachel gets buried on the way to Bethlehem. Now, look, at the end of the day, you could say they were traveling and it was childbirth and it was unexpected and they 
you know, they were in in uh, in shock. And but and we're talking about our patriarchs, presumably, and we know that they had a cave that Avram had bought. So you would think that it's not accidental. Rachel was buried there for a reason. Uh, and at the end of his life, Yaakov is saying so. So this source was <coughs> this week, Sedra, looking back at the end of his life, Vayachi, Yaakov says to Yosef, do me a favor, please. When I lie down with my father's uh, nice way of putting it, take me out of Egypt and bury me in their burial place. And he asked him to swear. Right. And by the way, Yosef takes care of his father's wishes. And of course, who takes care of Yosef's wishes? Moses. Hundreds of years later, Moshe. Moshe. Right. And who takes care of his wishes? Hashem. Right. Because you have this interesting little problem that we find in the Torah. It's an interesting lesson about Hebra Kaddish as well. Um, you know, I often make the comment at Leviah's, it's changed now, we don't do it, but the nature, the way we look at it in Judaism is very different. In, in many religions and cultures, you have hired pallbearers and you don't get your hands dirty. You know, you they carry the coffin and they do all the digging and whatever. In our tradition, in the United synagogue, because of health and safety, they don't. When I was in the provinces, the family used to carry the coffin often if they were grandchildren. The family would carry it for, to the grave from the uh, beer, whatever they call it, from the trolley. The U.S. doesn't allow that, okay, health and safety, but um, filling in the grave, we all take we all take part in it. We we get we roll up our sleeves, and even the greatest of the great gets involved in Hevra Kadisha work. I never heard any Rav certainly say it's beneath me to do Hevra Kadisha work. On the contrary, it's a huge privilege. We learn this from the Torah. Yosef looks after his father's needs. Moshe himself, no less, takes care of Yosef's bones. Someone else could have done it. And God himself takes care of Moshe, which is also so we don't know where he's buried. But anyway, so looking back on his life, Yaakov says to, to his son, Joseph, do me a favor, please. What, take me to Keva Machpelah. Now, R Joseph probably was quite close to his mother, remember? Well, he didn't know. Uh, yeah, he knew her. Yeah, Binyamin didn't know her. Um, we know that he felt loyalty to his mother. Um, so presumably he would have said, wait a minute, dad. What is good enough for mom is not good enough for you. So Yaakov does explain. Let's read source number three. Who would like to read? I'll do it if you like, Rabbi. Jeff, please. So this yeah. is the verse from Vayachi and also Rash's commentary. Yes, off you go. As for me, when I came from Padan, Rachel died in the land of Canaan on the way, while still some distance short of Ephraim. And I buried her there on the way to Ephraim, which is Bethlehem. Which is Rashi's commentary. As for me, I buried her there. I didn't even take her to Bethlehem to bring her into the land. Mm -hmm. And I know that you hold it against me. But you should know that I buried her there by divine command, so that when she would be of assistance to her children, when Nebuchadnezzar exiles them, exiles them yep. and they pass by there Raphael will emerge from her grave and weep and beg mercy for them as it is said a voice is heard on high Raphael is weeping for her children and God answers her there is reward for your work says the Lord and the children still return yeah. to their own border sure. Sure. right so what's Yaakov saying here he says, I know you think I should have buried her in the Machpelah, but I buried her there by God's command so that she would assist her children, basically, in the future, that she'll she'll beg mercy for them. They'll pass by her grave. Now, this is the ultimate Jewish mother that gives up self-sacrifice. Um, Rachel's a pretty, pretty principled person. Um, you know, one of the reasons the Torah says you shouldn't marry two sisters is the potential for strife. Right? If you know the the, we're not told explicitly in the Chumash, but the, 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 the commentaries explain. Uh, it's a classic question. Did, did Yaakov and Rochel really not realize that Laban would probably try to hoodwink them? So we know that the, the Midrash says they did realize. And in fact, they had a secret code between them that they would use. But at the last minute, Rochel gave her sister Leah the signs so that she wouldn't be embarrassed and humiliated. And in fact, we saw last week's Sedra again. And if you saw the story of, did anyone read the parasha last week? I'm sure everyone did. Yes, okay. yes. Yeah, so the story of the Dudaim, which is the jasmine, which is supposed to be an aphrodisiac. 
right? That Reuben's come home with this. Uh, we and, 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 thought it was magic mushrooms. Yes, and Roch, or, Roch could well be some mystical stuff. I think it says it's jasmine. It's supposed to have uh, aphrodisical powers. And uh, and Rochel asks for it, and Leia says, "Oh, you know, it's not enough that you uh, you you uh, um, you want to take my son's uh, um, you want to take my son's herbs as well." So Rochel says, "Fine, you know what? You can have Yakov tonight," which is a bit cheeky. And because she was so cheeky, Leia had another child. But the point is, one of my children said it about her at the Shabbos table. I don't know how much of the whole story they understood, but they said, "Actually, Rochel could have turned around to Leia and said." Who do you think you are? If it wasn't for me, you would never have married him in the first place. It was only my kindness to you that I didn't want you to be humiliated on your wedding night that I gave you the secret code so that you ended up marrying him as well. I, I sacrificed myself for you, right? The path of true love was diverted. So you're coming along and complaining that I asked you for some of the jasmine, you know, at the end of the day, really, he's my husband. You should never have had him. She didn't say any of that at all. She was very pleasant to her sister. Uh, she's she's a special person. All the matriarchs are special, but she, she's particularly special. And so she's the archetypal Jewish mother that says, don't worry about me, I'll sit in the dark. Now, don't worry about me. I don't need to be buried in the cave of Machpelah. It's fine. Bury me on the side of the road. I mean, whatever, it wasn't her. God told him to do it. But this is part of the idea. But this, the, the Jewish mother that cries for her children. Right? It's, it's Rachel that's always the one that weeps for her children. It's, very, it's a very moving idea. Let's have a look at Jeremiah. Jeremiah, of course, the prophet of doom, who uh, wasn't very popular. I think they tried to kill him. They all know that story. People didn't like his prophecies because they were all miserable. Not his fault. That's the way it was. So who would like to read number four? I'll read very it if you like. Please. Very famous prophecy, this. And so, and, so, and so says God, a voice is heard on high, lamentation, bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted for her children, for they are not. So says God, frame from voice your weeping and your eyes from tears, for there is reward for your work, says God, and they shall come back from the land of the enemy. And there is hope for your future, said God, and the children shall return to their own border. So it's basically Rachel's merit. You know, we say in all the liturgy, may he rest in peace, may she rest in peace. Doesn't sound like she's particularly resting in peace, right? So that's her merit. This extraordinary, uh, what we call Messias Nefesh, self-sacrifice. I, he doesn't say it, but I guess the others are languishing in relative luxury in the cave of the patriarchs, right? You know, they're reunited. Um, I had a very weird story once. Anyone ever know Rabbi Tam from Birmingham? He was in Hull before that. Pam, did you know Rabbi Tam? No, I've heard of him. Leonard Tam, he was in Hull at one point. Him. I think in the days of, spoke about him. So Rabbi Tam told this wonderful story that he gets a call in the middle of the night from someone he says, Rabbi, Rabbi, I'm really worried about my aunt. Why? She doesn't get on with her neighbors. He says, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, you know, uh, well, maybe I can speak to her. He says, oh, Rabbi, you can't speak to her. Why not? Oh, she's dead. He says, wait a minute. You said she doesn't get on with her neighbors. That's right. She's buried next to someone that she couldn't stand. <laughs> he says, I'm really sorry to hear that. Um, which cemetery is it? So they told him the cemetery. So he says, I'm I think it's somewhere in Kent or something. He says, he, he's racking his brains. He says, I'm really sorry. He says, but I, I didn't know that was a Jewish cemetery. He says, it's not a Jewish cemetery. He says, wait a minute. So your aunt's not buried in a Jewish cemetery. He says, why would she be buried in a Jewish cemetery? She's, she's a Catholic. <laughs> he says, wait a minute. So why are you phoning me? I'm a rabbi in the middle of the night. She says, well, I can't bother the bishop in the middle of the night. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um so when we say rest in peace by the way it's an interesting there's a whole there's a whole issue around that in halacha um you're not supposed to bury people next to people that they they had machlekes or broigas with it's it's because they're not going to rest in peace anyway um so rochel is certainly not resting in peace she is busy um advocating for her spiritual children right and it's a very powerful image in jeremiah a voice is heard on high a voice of crying it's rochel weeping for her children She's not, as long as her children are not comforted, she's not comforted, right? I guess the others are, I mean, I don't want to 
be disrespectful. But I guess the others are laid to rest in the cave of Machpelah, and that's the end of that. But she's uh, she's not at rest. Right? I mean, you, know, you think of all the kind of ghost stories and things. You know, this I don't know if it, it's a very Jewish idea, but you know, you have a spirit that's not at rest because something you know it was disturbed in life or it was murdered or, you know, something or, or, or the offspring are not behaving or, or whatever it is. So we see this concept in Judaism that Rocha is, um, is not comforted because her children are not comforted. Um, let's see how powerful her prayers are. Here, this is Rashi on that. Uh, who hasn't read yet? I haven't. Julian, over to you. So says God, a voice is heard on high, lamentation, bitter weeping, Rachel weeping. The Midrash Agada states that the patriarchs and the matriarchs went to appease God for the sin of Manasseh, who placed an idol in the temple, but he was not appeased. Rachel entered and stated before him, Master of the universe, whose mercy is greater, your mercy or the mercy of a flesh and blood person, you must admit that your mercy is greater. Now did I not bring my rival into my house? For all the work that Jacob worked for my father, he worked only for me. When I came to enter the nuptial canopy, they brought my sister, and it was not enough that I kept my silence, but I gave her my password. You too, if your children have brought your rival into your house, keep your silence for them. God said to her, you have defended them well, there is reward for your deed and for your righteousness that you gave over your password to your sister. So there it says explicitly the fact that she was, she gave, basically gave her happiness up, essentially. She had to so share her the, husband. What's the story about Manasseh then? Uh, oh, I don't know. He was one of the many wicked kings who brought an idol into the temple and uh, God was very upset. If you look, but basically throughout history, it's very interesting, the whole issue of kings. Um, you know, power corrupts and absolute power, power corrupts absolutely or something like that. Isn't that what they say? Yeah. Um, so why, why should Rachel defend him? Well, I, I guess we were, I think we were exiled for that. We we're often exiled for the sins of these kind of things. I don't know the exact, I don't remember any of that story, but normally we all suffered as a result when these kind of things went on we were exiled or we suffered. If you look through a whole book of judges, it's pretty much a, a, a boomerang of, or a seesaw of one minute God's happy with us and the next minute we have like a corrupt king or judge and it all goes wrong. Well, the judges were okay, but the kings weren't. A lot of kings were corrupt. Manasseh was the worst, wasn't he? Manasseh was the worst, I think, yeah. Oh, uh, what's her name wasn't too good? Yerevan either. But yes, Manasseh was a pretty wicked king. It's interesting. Um, I don't remember the whole story. You look up the story but remember there's a bit of a there's, there's an element of uh i'm thinking it's like the oxford union where people go to debate there's an element of a grandstanding in all these things it's like when moshe pleads with god to save the people hashem wants to hear hashem doesn't need us to tell him that he should save the people or forgive the people but he wants to hear that defense from our leaders whether it's moshe or you know um rochel in this case or the various prophets right you know it's part of the whole kind of system of i don't know whatever they call it the bible whatever that that although hashem doesn't need right? you know we see this in many many places um when god says to adam where are you of course he knows where he is right when he says to uh Cain are you am I uh, you know Cain says am I where's Abel he knows where he is he wants to hear him say it right you know the the power of um of articulating something so the good does God need Rachel to prove why he should forgive the Jews no but it's it, there's something very beautiful about our matriarch advocating for us you know um we find that quite a lot right and of course the most famous example is Moshe when he says to Hashem, if you're not going to forgive them, erase me from your book. And Hashem says, I'll forgive them. But just, you know, as a token thing, um, I'll also take you out of the Pasha of Tetzava, right? Where Moshe's name does not appear. Yeah. Um, again, the power of the words of the righteous. Right? Jacob got his wife. Oh, by the way, we've conveniently overlooked the fact that Yaakov got Rachel killed with his pronouncements. But anyway, let's let's put that to one side. Um 
So this is the power of Rachel's prayer, particularly. <laughs> um, the Midrash goes into more detail, but we don't have all the detail here. Um, I can't remember what my next source is. Let's have a look. Oh, that's the same quote. Whoops. Right. Now. Um, <laughs> Gone back again. Yeah. Sorry. Right, let's go back. Okay, so just to recap, we've got Rachel, who Yaakov says, I was told to bury her on the way, right? And then we have this subsequent story, the idea from Jeremiah of her petitioning for her children, right? But on the other hand, of course, Yaakov himself wants to be buried in Canaan. So why does he even bring it up? Why bring it up? Because he's stuck, in, stuck in Egypt. No, but why say to Yosef, I know you're upset that your mother wasn't buried in the cave of the patriarchs. Oh. You should just know that God told me that. But I want to, well, the answer is obvious, I suppose. In the context of his talking about his own wishes, it only seems fair that he should explain that. Yeah, I think so. That's fair enough. I wonder whether, um, whether there was any suggestion that Rachel's bones might be exhumed and taken to Machpelah with them. I don't think so. The fundamental question... That would question... have been a possibility, wouldn't it? Because after all, um, Jacob's... It wasn't going to be his uh, just dead body that was going to be taken. It was going to be his either his embalmed body or mm -hmm. his... Um, or his bones that were going to be taken. So they could just as well have exhumed Rachel on their way. But there was no suggestion of that. Right. No. <laughs> right. Let's go back to this. The, the glaring question here is, I get all of this that Rochel's grave being their first or place of pilgrimage on the way out of the land or even into the land. Right? And I get the idea of her crying for her children. But surely a very simple question should be that, um, like, it's like the old joke about the woman who wants his, her ashes to be, you know, um, what's it called? Uh, <laughs> scattered at, you know, Harrods, because her children then will visit once a week. You know, so um, why should Rachel suffer not being buried with all the other, in a special place, with all the other patriarchs and matriarchs, so that in the future, she can be of assistance to her children. Why should she suffer? All right, let's go back to this source here. Where, Jacob was says, Leah I, I, Where was Leah buried? In the cave of the patriarchs, but she died Washington. much later. So here, right, Rashi says, Yaakov says, I know you're upset with me, but you should know I buried her there by God's command so she would be of assistance to her children. She will emerge from her grave and weep and beg mercy for them. Question, why should she suffer? Why should she be a korban, a sacrifice? A martyr. Why should she suffer? I mean, you know, take it to the logical conclusion, bury everyone outside the land of Israel on the way in, or not outside, but why should she suffer? Is she Fair su question. Is she suffering? Ah, good question. Is she suffering? Right. Why? Why did you say that? Because it, 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 she, she's very privileged to be there to, 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 to people passing her all the time. She's visited, isn't she? Well, there is that. Let's make it much simpler. She's a Jewish mother. She's the ultimate Jewish mother. Mm. Right? We make jokes about Jewish mothers. Is a Jewish mother suffering when she sacrifices herself for her children? No, of course she's not. No. She's fulfilling her whole tough get whole purpose in life. The real question is why Leah wasn't buried there as well. Or Sarah and Rivka. Yeah. Or, or the, right? Uh, Rachel uh -huh. gets to be the archetypal Jewish mother. But she cares about her children. So we presume, I guess, I don't know, she told Yaakov in her lifetime, but Yaakov's saying it, it's it's not, this is who she is. It's not some slight to her that she wasn't buried in the cave of the patriarchs. This is who she is. She cares for children so much that she wants to be there for them. This is the ultimate honor for her. Please don't see this as a, as a degradation. It's not. And who's the one in whose merit we're going to be redeemed? We're told when we're exiled. Who's going to petition for us to God? It's not Leah. It's not Sarah or Rivka. It's Rachel. What a compliment. You'll say, okay, but why should she suffer? What's the suffering? Okay, she doesn't get... But, but is, it, is, it because, is it because because she was so selfless to let her sister marry? Ah, 
And that's what she says to Mother God, first. right? That's her whole being, right? We joke about the Jewish mother who would give up her life for her children, but that's Rachel. Any mother would. That's what a Jewish mother does for children. But, it's a beautiful but, story. But, um, sorry. I was going to say that, 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 that Leah had the privilege to be the, uh, the, the mother of all of the tribes and everything, you, uh, you know, the priesthood and everything else, because she was destined to be the, the uh, marrying I, um, Esau because he was supposed to have the birthright. Yeah. So she she got to to be her children were the were the the Kahanim and 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 uh, as David and everything else. Right. Yeah, I, I'm not very good at uh, explaining. That's right. my. Problem. No, that makes... oh, that's why I don't like to talk. Sorry, really. one second. So yeah, why why is Rachel's prayer? Let's come back to this question. Who said that she's the one that convinces God to forgive the Jewish people? Right? Why is her prayer the most effective? Because she's the one that's prepared to give up her. I mean, look, you know, people pay ridiculous amounts of money in shul membership just to be buried in the right cemetery. Burial is a big deal. They have a family plot in the cave of the patriarchs. She gives that up. The implication is willingly. I don't know if she'd said that to Yaakov in her lifetime or the fact that God tells him, but she's she's happy to give that up i mean that's the implication to save her children god says wow that's someone i'll listen to their prayers that's someone who puts their money where their mouth is that's somebody i'll listen to Hakana was the same wasn't she sorry one sec folks just yeah <coughs> The rain is suggesting this rotates zoom is on the thirteenth, which is Shabbos Hanukkah. Right. Okay. So about that. Okay. Right. So, um, yeah, this is the joy of the Jewish mother, basically, the, the, the idea of self-sacrifice. Um, didn't she? Hannah also did Right. That. You know, and this is this is the ultimate thing. Self-sacrifice is is a huge. You know, we say in the Shema, when we say with all of our being, basically, uh, sorry, with all of our soul, that's what we mean. It's not just being willing to give up your life for your religion, it's being willing to sacrifice yourself and your happiness, you know, and if that means not being buried with your patriarchs or whatever, then it's a very, very powerful thing. And it's that that with, rouses God's mercy. Uh, I can't tell you how Yaakov knew that Rachel should be buried there. He says that God told him. Uh, the impression the implication is that she she herself was was a factor in that um and there's a beautiful story with rev levi yitzhok of Beditchev. i've got it here actually i'll read the story i've shared it before the russian young kippur remember levi yitzhok was somebody who who always saw the good in every jew there's wonderful stories about him he's the guy that saw the guy davening while he was greasing the wheels of his wagon and most people would say, you know, you, you, what are you doing? You're in the middle of davening and you're busy with your wagon wheels. He says, wow, look at that. Even when they're greasing their wheels, they're davening to Hashem. So <clears throat> there's a famous story that uh, before Yom Kippur, people would go to a Levi Yitzhak's house to get a brocha. And uh, again, when you get a brocha from someone, you, you want to uh, you want to channel for the brocha. So people would give some charity. They would give a coin or something. So one year, Reb Levi Yitzhak said that anyone who's coming, writing their name and asking for a bracha before Yom Tov has to give me a ruble. A ruble was quite a lot of money in those days. So they say that all day he sat and he received uh, different letters and names from people. His desk was covered with pieces of paper and copper coins. Some people tried to bargain with his gabai, but Reb Levi Yitzhak said, no, it cost you a ruble. In the middle, around midday, a woman comes in 
She says, I'm a poor widow with an only child. I have only a single groschen, which is, I don't know quite what, in my purse. How can I pay two rubles so my child and I can be inscribed in the book of life? Please have mercy on me and my fatherless child. Add our names to your list. I promise to pay the entire sum as soon as I have the money. I'm sorry, said Reb Levi Yitzhak to the woman, but these are the rules. One ruble per name. She left heartbroken, resolved to attain a year of life for herself and her child, that one way or another, she would get the money. Now, I know there's other ways. You don't just have to get brochas. Anyway, right? obviously, I wanted a brocha from this very righteous man. Hours passed. The last of the petitioners had already left. It was almost Kol Nidre, and everyone was in shul, wearing their kittles and their talises, waiting for their Rebbe, Reb Levi Yitzhak. But he lingered, looking out of the window. And just before Kol Nidre, a small figure in a shawl was seen hurrying along the street. It was the widow with a folded piece of paper and a few coins in her hand. I couldn't pull together the money, she cried. Rebbe, here is my kvittel, my, my piece of paper. Please pray for me and for my only child, that we may be inscribed in the Book of Life. But you have only one ruble here, protested Rebbe Yitzhak, looking at the coin she placed on the table. Seeing that he wouldn't budge, the woman took her kvittel, piece of paper, and she crossed out her own name. Rebbe, pray for my son, she said, eyes brimming with tears, that at least he should have a year of life, health and happiness. Upon hearing these words, Rebbe Yitzhak's eyes came alive with a fiery light. He grasped the coins in one fist, and the piece of paper in the other, and he raised them to the heavens, and he cried out, Father in heaven, look! Look what a mother is prepared to do for her child! And you, shall it be said, God forbid, that you are less of a parent to your children? Can you look this woman in the eye? And not grant your own children a year of life and health and happiness. Right, so Rebbe Yitzhak obviously saw that he, was not, he wasn't just being mean-spirited. He saw an opportunity here to argue with God. Right, same way that we said Rochel did. and people, right, To say to God, look at this. This woman will put her own life on the line. She doesn't care about her brocha. She just wants a brocha for her child. So in the same way, you Hashem should put your children first. So that's what a Jewish mother does for a child. As much as we joke about Jewish mothers, and, you know, I have the Jewish mother change a light bulb. It's okay, I'll sit in the dark, don't worry about me. Um, that's what they do. That's what all mothers do, but particularly Jewish mothers, um, particularly Rochel. So it's, it's not an insult in any way. Yes, she wasn't buried in the cave of the patriarchs, but that's because of who she was. She's the archetypal Jewish mother. She wants to be near her children so she can continue to dab them for them. I guess she doesn't get too much peace. Right, any questions? Um, yes, yeah, so, um, I've got a question, but it's slightly... Sorry, one second, Brenda. I'm but... saying, right, right, Rachel seemed to not be obsessed exactly, but she harps on giving her sister away. Um, it must have been years and years and years later, but she's still... It's still okay, right. but think about it. She's... she's uh, I mean, we read in the Parsha that Leah conceived and had a child, and then uh, one sentence later, she conceived and had another child. Of course, in reality, you're talking about the passage of at least nine months. So she's had years of Torahs. She's had to stand by while her she was childless, while her sister had children with her husband. She even had to give her handmaid away. And, you know, she's probably thinking to herself all the time, if she was going for therapy, her therapist is saying, and what do you trace all this back to? She says, if I hadn't given her the stupid password, she would have got over it, and I'd be much happier in my marriage right now instead of having to share my husband with three other people so yes it was a long time ago but it was a life-changing event yeah i think she's got a right to be you know uh yeah it was a life-altering event look everything does, is michelle does this so... password hmm. hi mark look, right, does this password did... no 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 no. <laughs> right, no no but but right but say this does this password still exist to to today? Because if no, you've got twin sisters, it's not, it's... <laughs> you can't you can't marry twin, twin sisters nowadays. It's against the Torah to marry two sisters. No, no. What I'm saying. Oh, no, I don't no, know. no. What I'm saying is, if, if if you've got twin sisters, you know the other one might turn up. You know. Good question. So there was a story. Is, is I don't a know. I, I don't know. I, I assume that if you have identical twins that you and they get married, they probably have to figure out some way to tell each other apart. Yes, that could be quite complicated or embarrassing, um, whether deliberately or accidentally. 
There is a famous story. I don't think this story is true because it doesn't add up. But there's a famous story. There was a guy who was in prison and his identical twin brother came to visit him and they swapped places. And afterwards, of course, the brother says, can you let me out, please? He says, what are you talking about? You're in prison. He says, no, no, no. Uh, you know, uh, I'm the wrong brother. So the story goes, they had to let him leave. I don't buy that because they presumably would have arrested him for helping someone to escape or whatever. Um, but uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, you have to be careful with these things. Yeah. Um, Rabbi, there's just something, nothing, nothing, nothing well, something to do with um, Rabbi Sachs. Um, yeah. I would have thought he would want to be buried in Israel. I have no idea. You see, I, I look, I can't comment on that. I, I wouldn't be at all surprised if that wasn't down to COVID, possibly. I don't know. Oh, Challenges. Right. I, I don't know. I'm just speculating. I really don't know. Yeah, they couldn't take him out there. Oh, that's a yes. possibility, yes. Yeah, I, I, Brenda, I wondered that as well. Yes. I wondered that. Yes. Oh, that's probably why. About, about, yes. about, no, I wondered about him being buried in Israel. I yes. thought he might be. Mm. Yeah. I don't know. You know, it, it was, I don't know if it was sudden for his family, but I don't know. Who knows? Mm. You know, and then people want to be buried in a particular place and they realize that none of their kids are living there anymore. You have the classic provincial problem. Someone grew up in a provincial town, they have their burial arrangements there, but then no family left there anymore. And, you know, mm. some people choose to move, as it were, to London and others, you know. Some people seem to take the view that I'm not so bothered if people visit my grave or not. You know, it's just my resting place. I don't know. Some people are very hung up on it. They want their kids to visit and... Don't know, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, Thank you. But very interesting one this morning. And the idea of buying, of course, of purchasing a burial plot is is as ancient as as anything, because it comes, of course, from Afran. So there is this idea of purchasing a burial plot, which, of course, people do nowadays, or a burial rite. So it has a biblical basis. Um, okay. Just a reminder that we're back in Shul this Shabbos. Hopefully, that is the plan. Unless we suddenly... Well, actually, no. Even if we end up in tier three, we'll be back in short. How come? Yeah, uh, there was something I read yesterday. Sorry, what was the question? Because um, they, the government have now said that place of worship can stay open in all the tiers. Right. Um, I, I did look on the news yesterday before I went to bed, and it said that it finishes midnight Wednesday. But everybody thinks it finishes mon uh, midnight Tuesday. But yes, it is. Tuesday. No, it is midnight. No, it right. When you say midnight Wednesday, everyone gets confused. I must admit, to me, midnight Wednesday, I would think it's is Thursday Wednesday morning. night, yes. right? But actually, evidently, midnight Wednesday zero 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 is really Wednesday morning at midnight. Yeah. So they have said that from Wednesday morning at midnight, right. okay, the restrictions are lifted. It's very unclear. It's very confusing. Yes. I've Whenever you say midnight, yeah. yes, so it, and so you know, of course, we book in. But of course, you know that this determination, yes, um, the, the booking should be working, I think, for this Shabbos, actually. Uh, let me just check that. But of course, we know that the determination of midnight is not a new problem, because of course, we know that back in Egypt, they had this problem, right? If you recall, exactly when midnight was. And the Torah says around midnight, because we're told the exact point of midnight is a very, very exact, exact <laughs> point in time. Yeah. Because midnight is neither, it's the middle of the night. It's neither the previous day or the next day. It's what confuses things also is that it's expressed as either 000 or 24 o'clock, which is also confusing. It's, it's funny when you look at your clock and it says 000, it means there's no time. There's, yeah. There's a, a second when there's no time. Yeah. But if you go to the Shaw website, you can book for this Shabbos, yes. Okay, thank you. And did you know that Primark is going to be open all night? Really? Yes. Crazy. Is that because of, of Black Friday? No. Or just generally. Once they open, the day they open, they're oh, going to open. Oh, and just that day? Open. Yeah. It's not a bad idea, actually. Yeah, that, all yeah. night long. All night well, long. It's not a bad idea. I mean, I must say, all night shopping like Tesco and things can be very useful if you forget something. To, for those of us, not me personally, I don't have normal working hours, but for someone that works nine to five, I could see the benefit of that. Not that you want to go out shopping at 12 o'clock at night. Really? Oh, <laughs> us, us youngsters do. 
after four uh, hours, want to go be it be home. <laughs> it's actually the best time to go to Tesco because it's always empty. Yes, yes. Oh, and actually, in terms of safety <laughs> as well, huh? The shelves are often not well stocked during the night. Um, I, I usually find it's okay. Yeah, I guess it yeah. could be a problem. <laughs> right, I'm going to go and see how the right. plumbers are doing. Yeah. Okay. okay, everyone. I'm going to see some of you on Shabbos, hopefully. See you, Shabbos. Mark, I'll put the thing on YouTube. I'll send you the link. Uh, right. That's concert. great. Thank you very much. You're Thank welcome. You. Okay, bye, everyone. Bye. bye. bye.